the let's see start video. Does that work? Oh. There you go. Hey, look at that. Not too bad. All you right. Um okay, so here I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something that you might already have guessed, but okay. because I was way too close to Daredevil when I left Daredevil, I read your first issue, loved it, and then stepped away because it was too it was too here for me. I mean the, the, that's that's one of my questions. Actually. Well, but what I did was I read the entire run yesterday and today. So Holy I shit. am caught up, except I am on page nine of Devil's Reign number one. Okay. And I really feel like, but the reason why is because I literally read everything else. So I feel like I need to read these last few pages, which will take like, you know, I'll read it fast. So okay. should we let everybody else in and then I can like make a dramatic inference? So what do you think makes the most sense? Um, <laughs> we should let everyone in while you read it. I'll talk to them. You'll still be on video reading it, and I'll tell everyone that you're reading it. And we can just hear your gasps as I entertain them. That's perfect. That's perfect. All right. Okay. All right. Good. All right. All right. Let's do it. Would you look at this? The the the, the chat populating. It's true. Amazing. Just a second. All right. We got like seven hundred people in here. It's amazing. It's it's testing the the bandwidth and stuff. <laughs> really, it's really testing the bandwidth. Um, okay, so, so uh, uh, everyone, first of all, uh, uh, welcome to the, the fine folks that decided to join us. Uh, thank you, Charles, for doing this from a hotel room. You live in a hotel room, right? Yeah, I do. I, I live in, but not just one. All over the place, always. I just, you know, I'm a man yeah. in a suitcase. Which uh, what what convention is going on? Uh, I am us? at the uh, the Chicago what's it called Chicago Comics Entertainment Expo C two E two, which is a three day show starting tomorrow. I know you're jealous. I know you you wish you were here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. The last time I did C two E two, I got horribly ill, and ended up sleeping on the floor of O'Hare, uh, shivering to death. Uh, and missing it's the only time I've missed a day at a convention and so uh, I have fond memories of the show yeah no it's 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 great um I also hope everyone appreciates that I put the urine filter on uh for my video <laughs> it's good you were just saying yeah. you got a new camera so that that's uh that's great <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought people would like that you know it's I'm you know you know piss Christ you know that incredible work by uh mm -hmm. Andre Serrano yes yes of course I do well I'm if anyone my, would know my, that, it's me. Yes, of course. <laughs> I am doing my my version of that for the for yeah. the fans. <laughs> my version. Um, so uh, I just want to catch everyone up here. Charles, super diligent. He's a wonderful person, uh, 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 and um, and gives his all to his craft. And, and knowing he was going to be talking to me here, he he apparently read all of my Daredevil, which is uh, I don't know why anyone would do that. And he's eight pages into Devil's Reign 1. So he's going to continue to read Devil's Reign 1 while I, uh, while I just talk to you guys. So we're going we're gonna to hear his gasps of shock and his uh, groans of disappointment. Literally, this is, I am, he's not kidding. This is the issue. His, his so. groans of disappointment uh, as he reads along. And while he does that, you can mute me, Charles, while you, while you read. Oh, I'm going to. Okay, Definitely. yeah, please do. And, just, and just unmute yourself when you have finished reading it. And I'll entertain the people. Okay. Definitely will. All, All right. right. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, at the end of this, uh, after about half an hour, we're going to do like uh, Q and A's from people. They can uh, ask their questions on video, audio, whatever. But for now, I'm going to take some questions from uh, from you uh, in the chat, which I am uh, looking at right now. So if anyone has any questions in the chat. Feel free to. You know, I, I have to say, it makes me very uncomfortable to have you just like be talking while I'm reading because I don't. You might be saying stuff about me. You probably are. No, no, so no. I'm, gonna, it's all I'm just gonna get over it. I'm gonna get over it. But it's all, uh, it's all good. Geez. It's all good. All right. Okay. I don't know why I'll you don't trust me. Even minutes. still, you don't trust me. All right. I, good. Enjoy, enjoy reading this Marvel event. Um. Okay. So I'm looking at this, and it, you can't ask Charles questions because he's reading the, the comic. What the fuck are you doing, Evan CG? Oh my God! Uh, Grace inspirations to write Daredevil or organize the world of your Daredevil. Um, 
I mean, the inspiration is uh, all the great runs that came before me, and uh, I'm including Charles in that, uh, obviously. Um, uh, Daredevil is just such a great character, and it's a great title at Marvel because um, Frank Miller really kind of cemented back in the 80s that you can do whatever you want on that title. You can kind of break boundaries uh, and tell kind of mature stories, and it works. Um, and because he did that, I think every creator that followed has felt that kind of freedom to kind of explore things in a way that they, they probably wouldn't on like Amazing Spider-Man. Like I, I wrote Spectacular Spider-Man. There are rules <laughs> when you're writing Spider-Man that you don't necessarily uh, uh, have um, with, uh, with Daredevil. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the big thing um, is, is uh, the freedom of it. And, and what I wanted to do with Daredevil was to um, basically kind of explore uh, violence um, because it is the type of um, the, the type of comic that you can do stuff like that. Like you could, I couldn't do a story um, with a Fantastic Four where for 20 issues, they stopped being the Fantastic Four because Human Torch horribly burnt somebody. Um, it's just it's just not a thing. Uh, Marvel would not go for it. I always pitch it, um, but they, they somehow just uh, don't go for it. Uh, let's see, I'm just gonna, a couple more questions here. Do, 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 do. Where is blind spot? Great question. Um, Chip, do you think your workspace influences how you write, draw? Uh, I, I will say the pandemic has been a little tricky for me because um, as you see, I've got a studio and I've kind of, I've tried to make it a little bit better with some more art on the walls and stuff um, <laughs> because of the pandemic. Um, and I do all my drawing here because my, my, uh, my drawing uh, tablet monitor is here. But when it came to writing, like I used to work at a newspaper um, and because I worked at a newspaper, uh, <laughs> oh, it, he's enjoying it. Okay, good. Because I worked at a newspaper, it was like the newspapers you see in TV and movies where it's just, it's open concept, people kind of yelling all the time, people coming through. Um, I've literally heard people yell, stop the press which uh, is always a thrill. Um, because of that environment, I had to write with people constantly around talking, uh, write towards uh, crazy deadlines. So I found that when I'm doing comics, I would have to go to a coffee shop or somewhere where there's people. So I'd have that kind of noise around me. Um, so the pandemic has been really weird because uh, without that, um, I'm a little bit lost. So I've, I've tried to create a, a, a work environment that is uh, uh, comfy and, homey and kind of trick myself into thinking I'm uh, somewhere nice, <laughs> even though uh, even though I'm really not. Let's see here. What secretly Canadian things have you snuck into Daredevil? Um, apologies, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how secret that is. Um, Charles just reacted to something. You're right. Uh, do, 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 do. Before your Daredevil run ends, do you plan to pencil any issues? I love your art and sex criminals as much as I love your writing and DD. Well, thank you. Um, I drew uh, a four page um, uh, Daredevil short in Daredevil issue one because uh, uh, something happened where we, we ended up with the extra four pages. And um, we ended up with a, 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 what happened? I basically, I, I wrote a 20 page story for Daredevil issue one. And then I found out that uh, the sales department um, uh, gave us 10 more pages. And I was like, oh shit, um, Marco doesn't have time to draw 10 pages. So we did six pages, which ended up being kind of the, um, the confessional flashback stuff in issue one, which I think actually helped the issue a lot. I don't know if it would have worked as well without it. But then we had four extra pages and, and, and I kind of, I just took that as my opportunity because I was like, if you want something that will be on your desk in like three days, that's written, drawn and colored and lettered then uh, I'll, I'll be that person. <laughs> so I did it. And um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I might want to do it again. Um, you know, obviously I, I did that one issue of Spider-Man where I, I did all the art on it and um, that was really satisfying. I think people liked it. So I could see myself doing that uh, with Daredevil as well, but not for the final issue. Um, the final issue would, would have to be Marco for sure. Oh, Charles? I'm back. I'm back. Oh, he's He's back. All right. Uh, I just read the whole issue of Devil's Reign like that. 
Wow, um, wow, a lot of work was put into it. You just read it so quickly, that's amazing. Yeah, that's one of the fun things about comics, is that, <laughs> especially for the artists, especially for the artists, they love it. Uh, you know, it's funny, somebody asked me that uh, recently, like if that's upsetting to me, the fact that it's so quick to read the comics, but I've got a thing in my head where I'm like, well, if like 20,000 people are taking five minutes to read it, that's uh, however many thousands of minutes of, of entertainment. Like I can't, I can't focus on one person. What's that? Yeah, that's a hundred thousand minutes, Chip. Sure. Oh yeah, you're you're the smart guy, so that makes sense that you would know that. But yeah, well, I look at it. I, I look it at it as a whole thing. I what? So I in in you know speaking of reading it in a short amount of time. So I read your entire run from one to one to one. That's crazy. one to rain, whatever. That's crazy. In, in basically yesterday and today and. Uh, um, and as I was telling you before we jumped on the, the call, the reason I had, I read the first issue when, um, when it came out, uh, which was right after I finished my run on the title. And I, uh, in part just to be like, is this guy, you know, is this guy going to fuck it up? I hope so. Mm, but, yeah. um, but, you know, uh, unfortunately you, you didn't, it was, it was fantastic. Um, it was really like that first issue is, is, a, is just excellent, you know? Oh, thanks. Uh, and and I could see the direction you were starting to go with it. That was a little bit different than mine. And you had your own take and your own tone and just, it was, it was great. But then it's like, okay, well, I've been living there in daredevil world month in and month out for yeah. three years at this point. And it feels like you've had this weird sense of still kind of sort of a sense of ownership over it. Not mm -hmm. really, but a little bit to yeah. the extent that it's like, all right, I'm going to let Chip do his thing. And like, I'm going to go write star Wars and do other things. So I hadn't, I hadn't read any more than that first issue, which, um, is not something you always want to say to another writer that you haven't read their stuff, but I I, I um, get it. I mean, I've I've talked to a lot of writers who uh, feel the same way. Like I know um, uh, Matt Fraction and Kieran Gillen have both told me that they cannot read a title once they leave it. it, it it's like yeah. seeing your ex girlfriend walking down the street with somebody new. Like it's yeah. just it's just it's just really weird. And I, I haven't experienced that because I've um, I've tanked everything I've worked on, so nobody has followed me. <laughs> Like in Howard the Duck, like Howard the Duck, when we finished that, we, we walked away from it. It wasn't canceled, which is a nice feeling. And mm -hmm. then there were there were talks about uh, bringing in a new writer. And it was like one of these celebrity writers who would have been perfect for it. Um, but then it just it just never happened it because Lucas. it was George Lucas. Wasn't it? <laughs> God, that would be amazing. I, I shouldn't say who it was, but what happened was they became super famous while negotiations were happening and then just didn't have the time to do it. But their pitch was so good. I'm just like, oh, like I would read this Howard the Duck and then nothing happened. And then I did Star-Lord for six issues. It was canceled. I got the phone call, it was canceled. They did issue two. So like, <laughs> it's not like someone just immediately followed me. In Spectacular yeah. Spider-Man, somebody wrote a few issues after me for a crossover, but um, and I, I, I read those, but Spider-Man feels like a different thing because everyone's writing Spider-Man. Like it doesn't like feel like he Spider owns. Yeah, there's it doesn't feel like it owns. It's, there's no ownership of Spider Man. It, yeah, Spider Man is Marvel, but, but Daredevil. Really one Daredevil book, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and so it's it's and and they're. I mean, you're the fifteenth writer. I was the fourteenth. So like, there. Oh, okay. There really have not been very many people who've done it, and yeah. Um, you know, it's. I was somebody. I did a signing last night for uh, for Crimson Rain, and the somebody came by with the omnibus which i had not seen yet oh it, yeah yeah it just came out like this big it's, it's <laughs> huge and 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 seeing it all put together like that and it's very heavy it was just like whole, like i you know this job and it's not this way on every book but on daredevil in particular you tend it's like you're asked to write like a thousand page novel about daredevil that's what yeah. the job is and yeah. it swaps out every three years or so or four years and somebody else writes a thousand page novel about daredevil um and so I don't know. It was it was interesting, but so I so the point is though I I I basically mainlined your run over the last twenty four hours, and um, it was I think it, it's so interesting to see how you did it versus what I did, and the things that you're focused on versus what I'm focused on, uh, or I was focused on, um, and then how it's all how it all built to like it it plays with so many of the themes that. I worked with, but yeah. takes it to completely new places, just like I took a lot of the stuff that Mark Wade was screwing around with and, and did stuff with it too. So it's, I, I think, I'll stop talking in a second, but I think what it really underscored for me is how Daredevil is a, is a character with really solid continuity, that the writers yeah. do not really reboot it. If they reboot it, they take great pains to 
take into account everything the previous writer did mm -hmm. um, and like make it all work. And and so I don't know. It's just it was it was it was really fun to read it. Honestly, it, it, it's funny. Even when you think that they're not doing that, they still do it. Like I remember when uh, Wade was announced on Daredevil, and um, part of the announcement was that he he said he was going to do like a, a lighter, more fun kind of uh, a swashbuckling take. And I remember yeah. uh, Warren R Ellis, RIP, he's dead to us all, but yeah. um, he put out a newsletter saying, I've heard rumors that Mark Wade's going to make him light and fun. Uh, I'm assuming this is not true and he wouldn't be foolish enough to do this. Like he stated that publicly. And then obviously Wade's run uh, did quite well, but he actually still managed to take that light tone and carry over what had proceeded because 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 it turns out he, he was light because of depression from everything that happened before um mm -hmm. I, I think you're right like yeah everyone wants to put their own stamp on it but everyone respects the continuity of it because um it's such a direct line like when i was doing spectacular spider-man it's just like well, I, I don't know like there's spider-man stories everywhere what am i actually paying attention to um and you can you can find great spider-man writers but there's just not that kind of continuity that there is with the title like Daredevil. The other thing too is like, you know, Bendis's run, Brubaker's run, like Miller's, like the runs are so good. You'd be foolish to not, you know, like use the material. It's it's so, and I, I like, I don't want to like, and I don't want to, it just feels different. Like, I don't want to disrespect anything that like, you know, like when I wrote Swamp Thing, it's like, I'm not going to, you know, it was New 52, so I got to re redo stuff, but I'm not going to like, <laughs> purposely shit on things that Alan Moore did like it's it's dumb so yeah. um, anyway it was cool and and I thought Devil's Rain was great so well done oh, thank you um, I thought Crimson Rain was awesome um but before we move on to those uh I was gonna ask you did Wade give you any advice when you took over because you gave me some advice um not not really I mean he I there was a gap between Wade and me because we had mm. Secret Wars, um, yeah. and the so so for those who don't know, like Secret Wars was a big Jonathan Hickman did what Jonathan Hickman does, which he comes in and he says no one is allowed to publish any other stories in Marvel except the stories <laughs> that I'm doing. They all have to tie in, and so for a period of like four months, all we were doing was Secret Wars, and it was great, and we all had a good time with it. It was fun, but what that yeah. meant for my Daredevil run, Daredevil run, was Mark Wade stopped in the spring, and then there were Secret Wars over the summer, and then my run started in fall in November, I think of twenty mm -hmm. something. Um, and so I, there, you know, we we definitely talked about it. We talked about the handoff. I told him what I was going to do because I, I pitched it in a room with him there, which is always a fun fun moment. <laughs> yeah. um, but Right. We talked about, and I think you had, you had that experience, right. With like, didn't that happen? I think or maybe it didn't. I knew what you were like. We talked about it because we had yeah. to do the handoff. So yeah. I mean, anyway, it doesn't really matter. But so the, the point was I, I was talking to Wade um, about it and I told him that I was going to undo in a very respectful way. A lot of the choices that he had made because uh, I, it was, you know, the key to my run, we'll talk about our respective runs, I think, but a big part of my run was that I, um, you know, I'm an attorney. And so I really, really, really wanted Daredevil to practice law in a, yeah. in a real way in my run, because if, you know, what's, what's the point, right? If, if you're gonna have a lawyer in Daredevil and he can't be a lawyer. Um, and so in order to do that, I had to give him his secret identity back, which is something you obviously are playing with heavily in your run, because it, uh, it just, you can't have an out and proud vigilante who's also an attorney. It just doesn't, yeah, yeah. it's impossible. And so I had to put that back in, in the bottle. And and with that happening, a lot of things that he had spent a lot of time on, like Kirsten McDuffie, were gonna have to go away. And so I know we talked about that and, and it was mostly, it was more of a like, this is what I wanna do and this is why. And he's like, yeah, man, you know, go for it. It's good, so. Yeah, uh, the advice, uh, Wade also gave me advice, but uh, but the advice you gave me, I. I just flat out ignored because I'm stupid. Um, you you said, don't don't do Frank Miller. Don't rely too heavily on the Miller stuff mm. um, because that's what people are prone to do, and you should carve your own path. And I was like, okay, yeah. But then like when I look at it, like it took 20 issues to redo uh, Born Again, like, <laughs> which was done in seven issues uh, originally, and I I did it 
in 20 issues. So uh, I'm, I mean, you know what I thought what might be an interesting thing to talk about? Like if, unless people are bored, I, it seems that we got 56 questions in the chat. I'm not paying attention to what people are saying, but. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll do uh, uh, audio questions uh, later, but okay. yeah. But something I thought might be interesting because I like I just read yours and I know you read mine to, yep. as prep for writing yours. Um, I thought it might be interesting to each talk about what we think are the main things that we are focused on or did or are doing. Um, because it's it, like, you know, as I said, but I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to talk about what I did. I'm going to talk about what you did, at least what I think you're doing. Um, the places you're focused on and, and the way you're writing Daredevil, which is interesting to me, unless you'd rather I didn't. I, I mean, I mean you, you can you can go for it if you if you if you want. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I your run had Relax. so many. No, I'm just thinking like your run had so many fun bits that I've I've picked up on. Um, but I'm trying to think of what like kind of the, the theme uh, throughout it is, and I'm 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 blanking a little bit because I, I I've I've got all the details in my head. Like I think I think Mayor Fisk was one of like the greatest moves um, Marvel's done in the last ten years. Like it's such a solid uh, idea. It, it makes a lot of sense. It uh, I didn't get to play with it for very long, but I was very I was very happy with it. And and even you know even like setting it up and the campaign and all that stuff was was cool, but. Um, but as far as yours, the things that have really struck me about it were um, the the Catholicism of it, right? Like that was yeah. something in in Wade's run and, and even further, I think it happened in Bendis or maybe before, like, because Kevin Smith did his thing, which was hyper Catholic and yes. then Bendis pulled it way, way back. I think I'm, I might be spacing some of the details, but I think in Bendis's run, he explicitly loses his faith. And, yeah. and like he doesn't, he, he is not a practicing Catholic anymore. And then I, I grew up Catholic. So in yeah. my run, I put that back yeah. um, because it was another thing that I thought was like, I know that I grew up in it so I could write it. And yeah. so I, I had, there's a, there was a bit where he kind of comes back to the church mm -hmm. and, and then I made the church the, there was, there was a funny bit with that where um, there was a, this, this Catholic I don't know what it was like a blog and they they really like daredevil because he's a he's a catholic superhero oh yeah and so they were writing they were writing about have, have they tagged you or like done posts about your run at all um i i think early on like issue one or issue two they did that but uh, right. but i don't think i've had anything since well what they i mean so so for a little while, because when I when I brought Matt back to the church, they were super excited. They're like, oh, oh wow, this is what we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. You know, Charles gets it. It's going to be so good. And then the the priest confessor that Matt goes to, like, gives this big speech about what he thinks good and evil are and, like, what, what you know, how Matt can be somebody who hurts people and also be a religious person and all those different things. You yeah. know, you have to be a warrior for God and all that stuff. And then... Um, those guys hated it. They're like, this is not what Catholicism is. This is completely against all of the dogma. This guy's an idiot. He's a heretic. Charles is a fool. Um, and so, oh, Jesus. you know, it was funny. And then I, then there were no more posts about my Daredevil run. So I lost that audience, I think. But uh, anyway. Um, it's funny because like, there's, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, um, like I, I had, I've got a bit of Catholic in my background. I did like one year of Catholic school and my mom was quite Catholic when somebody died. For about three weeks and then she yeah, would sure. want to sleep it. in on sunday um so i was i was i'm super interested in the concept of violence and whether or not the church condones it and there's there are so <laughs> many blogs online talking about justification for war uh, through mm -hmm. a catholic lens um and also the opposite about how you know oh if you re really read those they mean you shouldn't use violence um that uh yeah, yeah. All, all the texts are just amazing tools for fleshing out Matt Murdock as a character. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, I was really, um, I was reading your run as it was coming out, and um, the uh, the Supreme Court stuff was uh, absolutely fast, fascinating to me because uh, obviously I'm not a lawyer. Um, and uh, I've shown that in my writing of the book in which I had a court case and then it didn't even go to court. <laughs> I, I did know it was very you, you, took, you took notes right yeah right, yeah you're writing around it I, it was 
I, I was like, so I really wanted him to be a lawyer. And apparently you wanted yeah. him to be a parole officer and a prisoner. Those were the, the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. the things you wanted to do. With <laughs> uh, we all make our choices. Um, yeah. But there was, there was a, an amazing moment um, uh, in, in the Supreme Court uh, uh, story where you, and, and I don't know if it's your idea or the artist to have, um, to have it be an action scene yeah, that was that was mine. I I rewrote that issue like like three times because I couldn't crack it because I had I so I knew the Supreme Court issue. So there's this arc of my Daredevil run called Supreme, where Daredevil yeah. has to go and argue before the Supreme Court, and um, he's he's arguing about this. It doesn't really matter. He has to go, and that's but basically that's the like World Series for lawyers. And and I have a relative who actually argued before the Supreme Court. I never have but I talked to him about what it was like. So I did a lot of research on what that experience is. And he's just like, they, they hammer you, they come at you, they are brilliant. Um, and, and it's not like a typical court case. It's really just them asking you questions, the justices. Yeah. Um, and so I wrote it, there's a version of that script where they're like, it's that. They're just like asking him all these questions. And I'm like, this is the most boring, no one, no, I don't want to read this. And <laughs> so I, uh, so I had the idea of like, how, how can I make it cool? And so then before you know it, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is like flipping over the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the bench. And like I forgot she was over. in it. Yeah. So uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it was fun. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, it's, a, it's such a brilliant idea to use comics as comics, you know? Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I super appreciated it. Um, um, so I have another question about your run, though, uh, okay. and it's it's an it's a specific question uh, on in issue twenty eight, on page thirteen, I think mm. it's panel three, possibly panel four. Yeah. Okay. There's a part where Daredevil punches a dude in the gut. Okay. Yeah. And the exclamation the guy makes, the thing the guy who's being punched says, is G R F exclamation point. Garf. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Garf. I was wondering if that's because you. You are such a fan of, of Garfield and Jim Davis, who I've met. I've told you this before. Uh, I've met Jim Davis, and you haven't. So, this is true. But I is have. Is that why uh, you did that? Um, uh, it's, it, that's just the sound um, that it makes. I don't know how many people you've punched in the stomach before. <laughs> that's the sound it makes. I've interviewed Jim Davis. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in person. No, no, uh, on the oh, phone, okay. and I also hooked him up. I hooked uh, um, him up to uh, draw the uh, uh, um, two pages in Squirrel Girl. So, so, we're, so you don't we're know tight. what it what it what it looks like when he smiles when you make him laugh. You know what that looks like. <laughs> no, no, I don't know what it looks like. But uh, oh, oh, sorry, just one second. He's going to bring Jim Davis up, guaranteed. Jim Davis is going to be right. But I do have a lovely framed note from Jim Davis. Mm, that uh, is pretty apologizing good. that he cannot draw a cover for sex criminals <laughs> so yeah that's true that's we're good. uh we're pretty tight yeah, yeah. <laughs> um anyway so um, uh so uh, crimson rain and oh, devil's yeah. rain uh yeah. we're super smart rain. and we 100 percent coordinated uh our mm -hmm. release day um so you were mentioning that it was a part of a trilogy, and I read uh, *War of the Bounty Hunters*, which was a ton of fun. Um, uh, I'm I'm always uh, amazed at you and the other Star Wars writers uh, on the comics at how you're able to kind of deftly weave in um, characters and continuity in areas where it just feels so tight, like in terms of what you can or can't do. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the, the War of the Bounty Hunters was tons of fun. And then um, uh, Crimson Rain just feels like it's setting up this really grand thing um, mm -hmm. that is ultimately fatalistic and a tragedy. And my first question is, um, uh, it revolves around Kira. Mm -hmm. For if people don't know, she's a character in the solo movie. So how did that part come about? Like, did you approach Marvel with the idea? Or um, did you know, because you're dealing with Lucasfilm, that Kira was a character that Lucasfilm didn't have plans for? Because I know they're really tight with stuff like that. Like, I tried to do a thing with Jar Jar, and they were like, uh, no. I'm like, yeah. it's Jar Jar, well, come on. Jar Jar, Jar Jar, 
they're a little weird about Jar Jar because Jar Jar is so freighted, right? There's a lot of yeah. like midichlorians is another concept that's very freighted, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of baggage that goes with them. And there are other ones too, but but Jar Jar is definitely one. And I'm sure whatever you've done or were going to do would have been delightful. But, oh, it's gonna murder uh, him. As, yeah, well, okay. That's probably why they won't let you do it. Because But it was a very heroic death. Anyways, go on, sorry. So so Kira, like, so there's this there's this thing you do when you're writing Star Wars books, um, is you try to get you you try to sort of it's just it's the same thing as when you're doing like a, an x-men team book or like a like a big super book like you, you know there's a listers b listers c listers z listers and then there's like you know that the characters that 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 have been off screen for a long time that holy shit bringing them back would be amazing just all these all these different ways that you yeah. spin the recipe for it and so i had from the beginning a pitch of of basically the story boba fett boba fett loses han solo and carbonite between Empire Strikes Back and Jedi and has to get him back. And like mm -hmm. all, and everybody else, like that's a valuable brick of carbonite. So everybody wants it. So everybody's going after it because yep. you start thinking about that and there's connections to all these different characters. And then I'm like, okay, well, what if somebody stole it? And then I'm like, well, you know, who'd be the best person to steal it is Han's ex. Like that's like, it's yeah. just the soap opera of it is perfect. Yeah. And then it was really about could could I do that? And so then there's a process of you you write up a document and you you pitch it to Lucasfilm. It's not Marvel. It's Lucasfilm that approves all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So so they then have their Star Chamber meeting where they talk about it. Like, is this a good way to use the character? Um, and and they ultimately just they I think they really liked it because it the way that you know hopefully you reacted to it when it happened was like oh shit that's going to be cool. Yeah, is, is the way they reacted to it. Like, there's a great story here. And it would be fun to see it told. And if if you can start from a place of that, as opposed to just like, oh, I want to, I want to do something badass. I want to see Darth Vader, you know, with a lightsaber twenty feet long. That'd be so cool. You know, that's that stuff doesn't play. But if it's like, but this felt correct for the character, for the franchise, and for the story I was telling, then it's it's really just do we trust Charles enough to get it right? And fortunately, they did. And that's yeah. It. I was going to say your relationship with Lucasfilm is obviously quite good uh, between mm -hmm. uh, novel and uh, and all the books. Um, do you feel like you were the only one who could have got this through? Like, like you have the inside knowledge of Lucasfilm. Like, are you kind of like I don't, I don't the go-to to Star Wars comics guy? I don't want to. I don't want to like you know toot my own horn. Do, do, yeah, that'd be crazy. But I do. What I, I guess the way that I would answer that is to say that I've been working for. Lucasfilm since 2015. So it's I'm like six years now. And I know all the people I have delivered for them a lot. And yeah. no, Kevin Scott has not written more comics than I have. Thank you very much, Adam <laughs> Maresh. Um, <laughs> I like Kevin very much, but I have I have written over 100 Star Wars comics. Uh, I can I, I can absolutely I can kick Adam out if you want. I have that power. I'll just press a button. <laughs> Um, no, it's just I. That's I. I. I added them up recently because I was like, "Holy shit!" I've done a really? lot of these things. I think I've written 102, and the closest person that I'm aware of is Kieran, who's written something like 70 something. So Kieran, wow, got, um, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. realize it was that high. That's amazing. Yeah. So so it, there's been a lot, and so they plus the novel, plus all the High Republic stuff, and so I just you know I I have a relationship where I can reach out to those guys with an idea and we can even workshop it a little bit and and it's 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 a nice place to be so i yeah. i think that i probably do have some leeway that maybe some other writers wouldn't have but yeah you know no big deal but is it a situation where um like i found doing the marvel dc stuff that um i do not have like a notebook full of ideas for these characters like right. um you know i kind of poked fun at bendis years ago uh easy to do as you know because Ben did an interview where he talked about how he had like notebooks everywhere notebooks all over his house and notebooks on his like exercise bicycle and his regular bicycle in case he ever had an idea for a character and he would write it down and um uh i did a, <laughs> a thing online before i was doing comics for marvel which was like my my marvel ideas journal which is like horrible horrible ideas um but i i don't i don't have that in real life but i don't really think about these characters until someone asks me to do so yeah. like when when somebody pitches me star lord or whatever i'm like okay do i have a star lord story then you start to to think about mm -hmm. it um are you the same like does um 
does Marvel or Lucasfilm come to you and say, hey, we, we, we want, we, we need something, something in this vein, something with these characters, and then you work at it? Or do you just, do you pitch it to them just kind of like, oh, I had this idea and you pitch it to them? Because I feel like you're, you're, you do so much creator own stuff too that's yeah. successful that I feel like your spare time is probably generating a lot of ideas for novels and for comics, like 8 billion yeah. genies. Right. It's, it's an I amazing concept. Eight, 8 billion ideas. Yeah. It's very, it's very challenging, that book. Yeah. Um, so, uh, which we should, we should definitely spend a little time talking about the creator own stuff too. We're, we're like, yeah, know, yeah. Just selling, selling these corporations ideas, Ugh, you know? The worst. But uh, we've got some ideas of our own, Chip. Um, they, I, I have, I don't know. I mean, sort of a little bit, like I think more for Star Wars than for Marvel characters at this point. I have, I have a couple big stories that it would be fun to do for Marvel at some point, but in the superhero world, but it doesn't, it kind of doesn't, it's okay if I don't. Like I have, I have yeah. told many, 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 many superhero stories. I don't need to go back to it at this point. Yeah. Um, working on one big superhero story, which I've told you about, I think, because it's mm -hmm. a Daredevil story. Yep. Um, that is that is moving along. That is beautiful. I've showed you some of the art from it, haven't I? You, sh you show me some. It's gorgeous. Like uh, I won't spoil who it is, or uh, but I, um, I how how many how many pages are done of it? Like it looks uh, laborious. The first issue is is done. Um, okay. So there's like thirty pages of art, which are unbelievable, and it's it's gonna be like a at least as we're currently planning, it's a three issue like hyper like prestige thing. Yeah. So all the issues will be thirty pages, and and it's 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 great. It's really yeah, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Yeah, the um, um, I I kind of feel the same as you do. Like I've I've kind of not like i'm like oh i've checked off all the characters and i've scaled the mountains and there's nothing left for me to do uh but there's there is a level of burnout on it as well uh i find like i think daredevil is my last marvel book for uh for the foreseeable future like i've, I've turned down a couple things i'm just like no i've got i got other things i should probably be doing and um it's hard for me to picture myself back in the room like 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 you and i have done those uh marvel retreats yeah. And you go into the first one, you're just like, this is amazing. Like, mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm here. Mm -hmm. Yo, yeah. I can't yeah. believe I'm fighting Dan Slott for there's the last uh, right up there. Yeah, there's Jonathan Hickman telling you, I don't want to tell you how to write your story, but and then telling you how <laughs> yeah. to write your story. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's too smart. I hate him. Mm -hmm. um, but then, uh, But then you find like subsequent retreats. You look forward to seeing the people but you're not necessarily looking forward to the process and all the talk of the infinity stones, which there is far too much talk about infinity stones in that room. I don't yes. think I'm breaking any NDA when I say we talk about those goddamn stones too they, much. They really do circle around quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I mean, I, I, I think they, they varied substantially and they, yeah. they were long. You know, they, they were basically two and a half days or three days of, of, of doing this and it's a very like it's one of the most heightened and challenging creative experiences i've ever had because yeah. you're, you're in this room with like with people who've been doing this for i don't know some of them been doing it for like 15 years 20 years yeah. like bandit you know whatever people have been there for a long time joe Quesada. Yeah. and and there's definitely sort of a, a it's not even a hierarchy it's more just like there's not a lot of air in the room and and the air that's being that is there is is breathed up very quickly so it can be challenging yeah. to get ideas across even if they're great um, and, and, but you really want to make a mark because the, the people in that room, you know, the people who make choices about the books you're going to be on. So yeah. it's exhausting. I always look forward to the dinners and drinks afterward more desperately yeah. needed the dinners and drinks afterward more, but you know. what was your favorite moment doing those retreats? Oh, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, there was, there were, I think my favorite creatively of those retreats that I was in was that was actually the secret wars one when, mm. um, which I think might've been just before, was it just before your time? It might yeah. Been. Yeah. It was the retreat before I think. Okay. So, so the, the, the basic idea of that retreat was, was Jonathan had set up this, this world where everybody could do what ifs. And, yep. and so they, everybody was pitching their what ifs on all, you know, you get to do a four issue. What if of, you know, what if the Inhumans were Casablanca, which is which is one of the ones I did, and yeah. what if we get to revisit all these iconic Marvel stories? So I I got to revisit Civil War, which is really fun, and so yeah. that oh, yeah, that was great. Everyone was Lenil, you drew that, right? Yeah, Lenil, you yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Oh, that was um, so good. 
Thanks, man. Um, no. So the the fun of it was like, okay, this is a this is fun. Like we we're not talking about Infinity Stones. We're talking about yeah. let's take these characters and tell the best stories we can with the rules, you know, basically gone. Yeah. Uh, and it was it was amazing. I really I really had fun with it. So um, it's funny that because so that, that was, um, what about you. I, I was uh, just gonna I, say like I was doing Howard the Duck and Secret Wars happened and we were told like because we uh, got five issues out we were gonna have to stop it and then relaunch yeah, it again yeah, yeah. and i was just like oh, god damn like i'm already sucked into a crossover and they're like do you want to do one of these secret wars things and i was like no i'm not a crossover guy i'm not doing it and so i didn't and then uh, i think scotty young and somebody else did like howard the human or whatever and it was fun mm -hmm. um and I, I i i managed to like avoid the crossovers like whenever they bring it to me being like you could bump your sales a bit i was like no i'm not a crossover man Mm -hmm. And then uh, two people changed my mind on it. One was Anne Nascenti, because I interviewed her about her Daredevil run. And, um, right. and like some of the best stories were the tie-in stuff. She did like Fall of the Mutants and Inferno. And those were just amazing New York level stories. Just mm -hmm. really well done. That advanced the character. And uh, she was like, well, she was the X-Men editor at the mm -hmm. time. So she, she had to play a lot. <laughs> Sure, sure, um, sure. but she, she took advantage of it and, and tried to figure out how this can help the story and then it was unfortunately it was Hickman that convinced me as well because uh, I forget I was like at dinner with him or something and like I was talking about how I like I don't do the crossovers and he's like he's like these are your friends going up to bat like with mm -hmm. their events and you want to support your team like right. that's why you're here you're part of Marvel like support your team man mm -hmm. I was like ah oh, damn it he's right and so I did like a King of Black the King of Black I thing in Daredevil. I, say, I thought it was really good. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know like some people are just like, oh, instinctively hate when you do a crossover. Like they just are just like, as soon as you put in alien symbiotes, they're just like, no, right. you're a sellout. But um, but I, I think sometimes it can work. Like I remember, <laughs> it's funny. I remember in a retreat when they were, I think they're trying to give you an infinity stone. Speaking of infinity stones. Like that, like Fisk was going to use an Infinity Stone. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Fisk was using Infinity Stone. Exactly. Right. And and I was just like, I think it was one of, I mean, I would always get into weird fights with Joe Casada. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know exactly why, but um, but I was just like, Charles's run is so good. And this Mayor Fisk storyline is like one of the best things that's happened to Marvel in recent years. Don't hobble it by tying it into something that is like, doesn't suit the tone of what's happening. Like, cause you're run. Like, I think the omnibus um, is a solid, amazing piece of work, and uh, it stands on its own. And without the kind of the extra stuff in there, it makes it. It's like, it's like if you read Born Again, and all of a sudden okay. there's like an Infinity Stone in that. Like, like it would, it would really kind of kneecap it a bit. Sometimes uh, continuity I, works. Sometimes it doesn't. You know. I remember that now that you say that. I remember you doing that, and I was very. Uh... I was very that was very nice of you to do because a lot of the a lot of the um the way that room goes is there's just tides and momentum and if momentum had gone that way this would have had an, uh, an infinity stone like it would have just happened yeah. yeah and um the so so and and it but you were, i mean you were right and that's how i felt too like the idea that the, the you know because it's ultimately it's a ground it's about politics and the way politics were at that time and yeah um I mean, thank God we fixed all that political stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, you know, and it, it also just, you know, clearly I was writing, like when I, when I do these long runs, whether it's in Star Wars or whatever, like I, I treat them like novels basically. And so, you know, yeah. there can be little side diversions and chapters. I like to put those in annuals if I can, but basically everything in that run built to where it was, was building to Mayor Fisk and, and then, Mayor Murdoch and then the big the hand and like all those different yeah. threads coming together like you know that Catholic priest I mentioned become was like part yeah. of the military you know yeah. order flag. And like, I don't know it was there's a lot of weird stuff I I, I read this well, you took me. huge swings it was great I mean I I uh I, I was I read a review of the omnibus somebody got it and they they were like reading this all together it's like what the comment they made was that I like I just could not stop making up new shit and they're like that's cool but like he seems like he's he's doing it on purpose which i guess i sort of was i don't know i mean i guess you don't make up new things not on purpose but it was yeah it, like that yeah. that is the thing that they took away from the run is like i just kept making up new stuff all the time and but 
I don't know. So what? Right? That's fun. Yeah, that's so. that's it's fun and it's part of the job. You don't want to rehash stuff. Yeah. Like um, you bringing Mike Murdoch in uh, officially. Well, I, that's the other thing I really wanted to talk to you about was Mike Murdoch. Because well, I was gonna I was gonna ask yeah. you before you say anything. The um, when you're doing the read of my stuff, did you read the Daredevil annual? The Daredevil annual was in it, so oh, I read okay. the right. one where you the the Norse. Yeah. Um, What's the Norn Stone, yeah. Norse stone. Like basically a, an Infinity Stone. I know, yeah. Here I am trying to get Infinity Stones out of here. I'm right. just jamming right. them into mine. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I thought that was great. And then there's a little subtle moment later when he refers, when he's talking to, when Mike is talking to Daredevil and he refers to something that he shouldn't know about. And Daredevil's like, wait a minute, how do you know that? Like it, it, it and so at some point I, I would guess that's something, that's a thread you're going to lay down, but um, you know. We'll see. Um, yeah, it's funny because like I, I loved, um, I really love those issues because Phil Noto too is uh, is amazing drawing Mike Murdoch, um, <laughs> and he's such a great character. But my only problem was <clears throat> when I wanted to bring him in was having to explain the conditions of him every time. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was weird. I would have fixed it. I just ran out of time. It was. Yeah. I mean, it was great. Like it was fun and it was very much. Uh, um a marvel comics kind of fun solution the same way using a nornstone is but uh yeah it's it's like i just had to tidy it just enough so whenever he shows up it's just like it is matt's brother just so yeah. we don't we could didn't have the inhuman conversation yeah, absolutely uh, i i like how you you studiously avoided using the word inhuman too uh, <laughs> yeah which makes sense to me i get it i get it yeah. Yeah. um yeah, I I think so. So Mike Murdoch was was an idea that I had kind of late. In, I was gonna in, say it was like right near the end. Yeah. Yeah, it was near the end that I had the idea to do it, and it was, um, and I I just I was like, man, this is solid gold. Having had giving giving Matt like this fuck up prick brother mm -hmm. who's kind of a criminal and just like a like a shit bag, you know, like mm -hmm. that's perfect because Matt is is. It, it gives a lot of context to Matt's choices, I think, in a way that, like, he always should have had a shitbag fuck up brother. Like, yeah. it, it, it makes him, it makes Matt better and more interesting. And I think Mike alone is, is very interesting. And you could, it just at all, even what you did in the annual, like, that's how it would have been. Like, yeah. those two kids growing up together, like, it all just, it felt like it, like, a thunked into place in a way that story beats. If, if it's, you know, you know how right it is when when that happens. So I yeah. was very excited to see you using it. I actually was really excited to see you using a lot of the continuity. Like you yeah. really built on what I did, which was awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> your work is great. Like, why wouldn't I? And like, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm often not genuine, but I like, I love your stuff and having the, uh, the gift of following you um, and being able to mine the stuff that you did uh, was, uh, yeah, it was like an honor really. Um, well, that's that's ridiculous, but uh, but it's nice of you to say. And I, because um, I mean, like uh, I don't know what your favorite Daredevil run is, but uh, mine is uh, the Anasenti Jarmita Junior stuff, yeah. because it took such big swings. And I feel like yours is kind of the spiritual successor to that, mm -hmm. like dealing with the beast and the hand on on, on such a, that grand level, and the the Mayor mm -hmm. Fist stuff and the Supreme Court stuff and uh, um, uh, yeah, all, all of it like. It, it felt it felt very much like I was kind of reading those comics. Yeah. Well, I I appreciate it hugely, and I I also um, like along this. If this is what we're doing, then I will say it has been uh, <laughs> you're not know, really really extraordinary to see that you know the way that you've gone from you know the 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 sort of I don't even I don't want to like diminish the work that you did on Howard or anything. yeah exactly that that kind of shit right the you know the the dancing clowns. <laughs> really deep sort of examinations of of guilt and violence and 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 despair and and like you know all of it while at the same time you laid out an incredible like i didn't see it coming but i should have seen it coming the way that so i, I it, i'm gonna spoil some stuff uh, yeah, it's yeah. late in in chips one but whatever yeah. um that uh, that wilson fisk uh gets married which always goes well for him whenever wilson fisk mm -hmm. he is man he is a yeah. he's a a merry man um so the but the person he marries is typhoid mary holy shit right it was right there in plain sight the whole time 
Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Um, uh, you know what so, we tried? Okay. You know what we tried to do for that issue? We tried to get John Romita Sr. back to recreate the um, uh, Amazing Spider-Man wedding cover. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. With Fisk and, and Typhoid Mary, and get like Romita Jr. to ink it because it's both their characters, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Um, but but uh, we were told definitively he is fully retired. I was like, ah, oh, yeah. it would have been so amazing, so amazing. Yeah. Um, um, I, uh, I had a experience at a convention. Uh, well, just a, a John Romita Sooner Senior thing, where there was a guy who I hope he's not in this chat, but he was super super nice, and I met him there, and he he somehow had a collection of items from John Romita Senior, uh, and like from his like archives or his house or something like that. Okay. And he's like, would you like one? And I'm like, I, I guess so. I'm not an artist. He's like, oh, that's fine. You know, you're in the, you're in the, the zone. So sure. I have, I have John Romita's like drawing compass, you know, like draw a circle. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, it's in this room. That's wild. Um, I, I, was I, wild. I, I, I met, I met him when I was, uh, I, I must've been 11 maybe whenever the Spider-Man annual came out the wedding one. Uh -huh because he was in town doing a signing. And uh, I was like, I knew he was the art director and I knew this was my big break. So I mm -hmm. took my best, my best drawings and my cool uh, characters and I stapled them to comic book backing boards for Absolutely. excellent presentation, waited in line for three hours. And like, he was so sweet. Like I got up, you know, I just slid the comics to him. He's like, want to sign them? I'm like, mm -hmm. he signed them. And I just like slid my artwork towards him. He's like, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And I'm like, mm-hmm. And he's just kind of, he's holding, he's like, do you, do you want me to sign it? And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> so he signed it. And he wrote, um, he wrote, uh, John Romita, pretty good. <laughs> so I've got, <laughs> I've got a piece of art of mine with John Romita's signature on it and pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah. Uh, quite a moment in my yeah. life, I tell you. Yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> Um, it was. It's part of why I love comics so much is the fact that your heroes are um, available. Yes. Like, like there's no other uh, kind of art form, I think, where that's true. Like, you know, small bands, yeah, you can like maybe hang out with them, um, but not really. Not really. Uh, novelists are just kind of like kind of on their own and they'll go out and they'll end up doing right. book signings and then they'll retreat again. But because of comic conventions, um, the accessibility is just uh, massive. Like, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I'll be at a show where I'm like, next to me is Sergio Aragones and across me is Mike Mignola. I'm like, why, why would Mike Mignola like need to do this? But he doesn't. It's just fun. And you get to see people. I mean, that's kind of why I'm, I'm you know, here. Yeah, that's of course. C2E2. And, uh, you know, I have, um, I have this book. Uh, one of my new books for 2022 is this book I just announced it this week. Um, it's called 8 Billion Genies. I was going to say. Artist is Ryan Brown, who's a Chicago guy. Yeah. And uh, the, the premise, I've told you about this book. Like, yeah, 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 you did. It was amazing. But the, the, the premise of it is that everyone on earth gets the genie and one wish, not three, but one wish uh, at exactly the same moment. So every, like everyone, like over their shoulder pops up this little like blue genie thing, which is a very fun design <laughs> and uh, that Ryan did. And then it's like, you know, okay, what, what happens now? And um, so figuring that out in terms of a, you know, what the hell is going to happen now was, was really the hardest thing about that book. But then I figured it out and now it really, it's, it's very, very cool. Well, you're, um, you're, you're so good at coming up with um, amazing ideas that can lead you so many places. Like, cause your, your novels, Oracle Year and Anyone, they both have just kind of like, kind of a they're simple kind of high-minded premise to each of them. And whenever you, whenever you say it to somebody, everyone has their own idea of what could happen. Mm -hmm. But you're so good at taking that and then like actually working it out and thinking it through and what the reality of a situation would be. I mean, I know 8 Billion Genies is less real, but, um, but, it, but as soon as you told me that, I'm just like, oh, this is such a Charles idea. Like he's, you're, yeah. it's, it's a big idea. What happens next, you know? Well, the, the funny thing about it is that it is actually, it's a Ryan Brown line like he had a, okay. he had like a, a list of like idiotic ideas for stories and he, like, <laughs> yeah. he to tell people in interviews and stuff like that like oh, yeah. one day i'm going to do a comic about this and and he said that to me i'm like wait a minute there's i really think there's something there he's like there's not anything there quit it and i'm like i think maybe there is and so and he told me this before curse words which so years ago and it's always oh, wow. been spinning around in the back of my head 
And so trying to figure out how to crack it was really the hardest thing. But the way, I mean, I'll tell you a little tiny bit about the way yeah, yeah. it was cracked, right? So it's an eight issue series and um, each issue is broken out into increments of time, okay? So, so the first issue includes the first eight seconds and then the first eight minutes. So it's what happens in the first eight seconds, then what happens in the first eight minutes all around okay. the world, okay? Yeah. And then issue two is the first eight hours, and then it's the first eight days, the first eight weeks, the first eight months, and all those things, okay? Yeah. Because, and I don't want to spoil too many of the surprises of it, but it, it, it starts in a bar, and in the first eight seconds, the owner of the bar says, I wish that no wish made outside this bar can affect this bar or anyone in it. And <laughs> So, so the bar uh, becomes great. basically an island that we can experience this event through because that is a safe spot. Oh, and that's so, amazing. And so you go through these eight issues, you end up at the first eight centuries is, is you know, the end. Um, and uh, it, it, it is very much a me kind of, okay, how would this go? How would this work? How would it, how would it play out in these different time periods? Yeah. And um, we've done three issues. It's super, super cool. Um, you know, I'm excited about it. Yeah, Ryan Brown's a genius. Uh, Curse Words was fantastic. And you've got, um, did I read it right? Like you've got the first issue as a, like an ash can for CTV Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not even an ash can. It's the whole first full color issue. It's uh, it's at, um, we're going to have it live and in person. I keep like C2E2 is actually. It's right there. It's right there. It's right there. Uh, yeah. yeah it's basically right back there. We're going to have it this weekend. And also if you sign up for my newsletter, which is at just charlesoul.com, um, we were we are making it available at our web stores tomorrow starting like during the show hours so tomorrow yeah. morning from i guess uh 10 a.m central to 6 p.m central on sunday so if you aren't if you want it and you like subscribe to chips and you're not subscribed to mine just go sign up on my website it's free i don't charge money like chip does no fair enough um and, and let me just say um uh charles's newsletter definitely go sign up for it. It's uh, super professional. It doesn't bombard you every three days like some people's newsletters <laughs> in the Substack uh, era. <laughs> there may yeah. be too many newsletters <laughs> flying around. Um, Charles is, uh, are fun and informative and uh, you won't regret signing up for it. Uh, let's um, take some questions. Uh, uh, I agree, I agree. So, um, so this is the way it's gonna go. I've uh, enabled everyone's video. You can turn on your video to ask a question. Um, and uh, when you uh, do um, press the little, uh, the reaction button with a little hand up or raise your hand in your video and then uh, that way I can uh, tell that you want to ask a question. So um, you people- that? You can manage all that? I don't know, we'll see. Um, <laughs> You're right. Don't Video's see. still disabled. Evan CG says that. Well, I've, uh, I've uh, oh wait, start video. How about now? All right, Louis, Louis. Lewis Rosen. Oh, let yeah. me see. I see that person. I see Evan. Ooh, oh, there we go. Look at there's there. people. All yeah, right. So there. now, uh, now that people are showing up, like might be an attorney. If anyone, if anyone Evan wants to ask a question, a law. raise your hand. All right, Evan. All right, just one second. All right, unmute yourself, and I'm going to throw you up here. We're recording this, I should say, so you will end up on a video if you uh, decide to join us. All right, Evan. Great. Way to tell me that after I show up here. Uh, Chip. <laughs> uh, Charles is my lawyer. Uh, he <laughs> says it's okay for me to do that. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Charles, uh, I wanted to ask about She Hulk. That's one of my favorite all time comics. I just think it's yeah. so wonderfully um, done. So I wanted to, uh, it's tight and it's great. I love the, the twist of the villain and everything about it. Um, I just want to know any anecdotes or anything you have to say about your run on She Hulk. Yeah, I mean, well, thank you. I that was that was the one of the the two books that I did at Marvel that really made me think that I could do this as a like I was it was worth sort of putting even more energy into it than I had been. The other was Death of Wolverine, um, which is a very very different book than She Hulk. Um, but I at the time, you guys know Ritz Johnston, the the maestro of Bleeding Cool and the uh, you know, Enfant Terrible. Um, oh, <laughs> that's a nice and, way to put it. Yep. And he, uh, he reached out to me, like we were talking about something and I was like, 
he, because I'd known him for a little while and he had, he had actually helped boost one of my early series and whatever. And um, he, I said something like, man, death of Wolverine. Like I, you know, I can't believe it. I've made it, whatever. And he's like, death of Wolverine is not going to be the thing that is the reason you have a career at She-Hulk. And I think in many ways, I think he's correct because yeah. that there's been a lot of really great Wolverine stories. I think Steve McNiven and I told one in death of Wolverine, but, but She-Hulk is, is a really hard nut to crack. And, and I think that people reacted to it in an emotional way that they carry with them. Like people, I hear all the time that people really remembered that book. And, and I think you cannot cut out Javier Polito and Ron Wimberly on it. Like the art on that book was spectacular. Yeah. Um, it, it was, it was just sort of, you know, the, the way that we were, it actually, it was, it was, you know, I, I think this is an obvious thing, but it was, it was a good training wheel situation for, for Daredevil. And, uh, in particular, there's a, there's a three issue arc uh, in the second half of the, of the run where I had She-Hulk and Daredevil go up against each other in court and, yeah. uh, defending Captain America, who's been accused of murder. And I remember just like killing myself to make that work because it was so incredibly challenging to, because you have to, there's so many guardrails around, oh wait, Captain America is going to be on trial as a murderer, like, and right. it's going to go back to World War II and it's going to be flashback stuff and like, you know, how's that? It's very much like I'm sure a lot of the stuff you had to do with when you're, you know, when Daredevil was murdered, like literally murdered somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, you know, I don't know, like, and, and then it all came together so well. And I remember being like, I'm as proud of those three issues as I'm proud of, as anything I've ever done. It was so hard. Yeah. And it just, and Javier and I were very much in sync. Uh, and it's, it's beautiful. So, um, I guess I don't know if that's a good anecdote, but it's it's I love Perfect. that book, and I, I'm glad. You did. I think I think your um, your She Hulk run is uh, similar to Dan Slot and All Red doing Silver Surfer versus oh, yeah. Dan Slot on like. Actually, Ed? Hmm? It is. What? Oh hey, it is. Ed just showed up. And then disappeared. Uh-oh. We got um, another. We got another Daredevil. But but I th- I think it, I think it's similar oh. to uh, cool. yeah yeah so to Dan doing Silver Surfer with the All Reds versus him doing Fantastic Four. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's the Death of Wolverine versus She-Hulk. Yeah. Like, I think yeah. people will, will, I mean, his Fantastic Four stuff's great, mm-hmm. but it's going to be just like a part of the Fantastic Four history of that group. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Silver Surfer is going to stand the test of time the same way the She-Hulk run is. as just like, yeah. just a really fun, fantastic book. And yeah, beautiful, uh, uh, with a consistency of art, which is uh, a big yeah. thing. Very difficult yeah. to get these days. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, Thanks, guys. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm. We're skipping the line here a little bit, just because we've got uh, uh, Edmund Brubaker. <laughs> All right, I'm going to remove this guy spotlight. Man. All right, uh, Ed, we've we've only got a few minutes, so do not just go on and on. All right. Whatever you got to say, just say. Wanted it. to uh, first off, I'm wearing my reckless shirt now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I yeah, wanted yeah. to ask. You guys are both two of the most productive writers in comics. Charles, I don't. I've met you a couple times. Chip, I know you really well, but I still don't totally understand your process. So I wanted to ask. Like, I know how fast you script, Chip. I don't know how fast Charles scripts, but I wondered. When do you guys find time in your week to do like your plotting for or your or whatever your your version of a outlining is for an issue or a chapter of a graphic novel or whatever? Like when do you find the time for the thinking part where you have to put it down on paper before you can type? Charles, I'll let you go first. Uh, I will yeah, let me grab I have because I'm I brought some to do on at the convention. Mm. This is perfect. So, this is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that this would happen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm 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 big on these, right? Moleskins. Oh yeah. And, and this is yeah. one for for the Star Wars stuff I'm doing right now. And this is one for um, a creator own series I'm doing. And so I I always have these with me. And so I live in New York City, right? So if I'm on the subway, I'll I'll jump on and you know just just you know jot down a bunch of ideas. And I usually will spend. So I, I can, I don't, I hate doing it, but I can do an issue in a day from, from zero oh to God. finished. Wow. Um, that is horrible. I don't like doing it. I don't think it's my best work, but I have done it if I have to. A, a, my perfect version of it is, is break day one, 
you know, just go to a, go to a coffee shop or a bar and just break day one. And by the end of that, I've got a, I've got a 20 page outline for the whole issue. Um, and then day two, I'll write 10 pages and day three, I'll write the other 10 pages. Oh, wow. What yeah. I'm, I'm, to happen, go ahead, Chip. I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm almost, that's exactly my, my method as well. The three day, the break it, and then over two days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with, when things are intense as they have been recently, uh, it's more like, write 10 pages and break an issue of, of it's something else on the same day and then you know shift so it's it's stuff stacking up i rarely get those three days on only one thing these days which is a which is a bummer yeah yeah awesome. that Definitely. can be a real drag when you have to jump from thing to thing to thing constantly it's hard to maintain focus like how how, how are you finding it because um uh, i know you're in a writer's room right now yeah. so how does that affect yeah, yeah. your schedule uh, I'm writing comics mostly. I, I was writing them in the morning at first. And now, now that we're to the point where we're writing outlines, I can do a little bit of comic writing in the morning before I turn to that stuff. Yeah. But um, mostly for the last month, I was just only writing comics on weekends. Yeah. And, you know, that was just enough to keep up with Sean Phillips. So, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. yeah he's a monster. Fast, right. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, like too fast. I was, but yeah, I, was, I don't want to take over your thing. So. I was just going to say, like, um, you miss all of our daredevil. <laughs> you miss all of our daredevil talk. But since you're here, um, mm -hmm. I, I pose this question to Charles. I heard that you both said my run was your favorite run, which is just no. <laughs> fake, fake news. It's fake news. <laughs> um, I was thinking about it because Chip does a whole thing with Daredevil in prison too, and it's very different oh, yeah. than what you did. Um, yeah, but it's I, really, it's really interesting how you approached it so differently and it, anyway I, I, find, I, find, I find it hard because like when I start to think about like the natural progression of the character if I was you know setting it up where he kills the guy like I'm like well he's got to go to prison only mm -hmm. through the guilt that he carries over it yeah um, but I knew because of Ed's run, such a part of him I, I knew because of Ed's run I'm just like well everyone's just going to be like oh again which you know <laughs> there were there were people that did that I'm like there's only so many <laughs> situations and stories like when you think of like the checklist of like oh can somebody else be daredevil can daredevil have a kid yeah can daredevil have a secret family member can he die can he come back like <laughs> there there are only so many kind of things and situations you can put characters in before you end up repeating it over like 70 80 years or whatever these characters have been around so um yeah. I knew the, the presence of uh ed's uh devil cell block d kind of weighed heavy on me as i was working on that but uh, hopefully it's different enough that it worked but i was going to ask you I, I asked um charles if uh bendis gave him any words of advice uh when when there's the pass over there because i got some from charles did did mm -hmm. um Oh, sorry, wait. Uh, so did yeah. Bendis give you uh, any words of advice when you took over? Well, we were, we were in pretty much daily contact back then because uh, he kind of brought me into Marvel. And this was oh, okay. like right when I was doing my first deal there, I'd been writing Captain America for like six months. And then, and then they wanted me to, he called me to say, hey, we want you to take over Daredevil. And then I sort of came up with my pitch for it. And I didn't know that he had wanted to leave Daredevil in prison at the end of his run, like the end okay. of Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wanted it to be like the last episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> like if you look at his last page, it's like it keeps panning out. Yeah. Um, but Joe was like, you can't do that to whoever follows. And so I had come up with a pitch that I wanted to follow what he was doing. So at the end of my first arc, Matt Murdock was gonna get arrested and thrown into Rikers. Um, and then I was going to do, you know, the devil in cell block D um, as my second arc. And then I was, I was sort of running through my pitch with Brian and he said, wait a second. So you're going to put him in prison, like five issues in. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, I want to end with him in prison. <laughs> we, went to, we went to our editor and Joe and basically we're like, Hey, we want to like coordinate this so that, um, you know, like he can end his run on like this huge fucking cliffhanger and then I can take over. And it's like, we're not gonna lose any readers that way. Like you're yeah. gonna wanna see like, wait, how does, how the hell is someone gonna follow this? Yeah, As opposed super smart. to, you know, him having to end things like on some nice moment and then I've got to blow everything up. And then I did the same thing to- uh, Oh yeah. 
to, to, to the guy who followed after me, uh, I left it where like Matt Murdoch had just taken over the hand, which was like something Joe really wanted me to do. And I was like, I don't really know what to do with that. So I'll just leave that for. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's like it, it's become kind of like people talk about it like it's a tradition now that a Daredevil writer has to leave the next Daredevil writer in a really shitty spot. And it's funny because yeah. I remember like Charles and I went to lunch with a Daredevil editor to kind of talk about handover stuff when I was in New York. And I, I, I was telling Charles kind of what I was thinking and um, he was really supportive. And I made the joke that, oh, it's funny because like normally Daredevil writer screws over the next Daredevil writer. He's like, yeah, I wonder, I should kill him. I should kill him. And I remember you just going, I should kill him. And I remember I was sitting there, you know, eating my burger, just going like, but I just told you what I'm doing. Like, please don't kill him. <laughs> I should kill him. <laughs> and then he, and then, you know, he, he did kind of like, <laughs> they announced like the, the death of Daredevil. And I was just like, yeah. oh no, like, what, like we've already written issue one. Like what's going on here? But I, I knew Charles wouldn't screw me over. Yeah. He's a, he's a good man. <laughs> He's yeah, a good it's, man. Uh, it's a cra- it's a crazy fun job to have. It's probably the best job you could have at re- at like regular Marvel. Yeah, you know? I agree. Like, I agree. I you don't so. really ever have to worry about anything going on outside your book unless no. unless like what you're doing now where you where you make it part of an event. But that's rarely happens in Daredevil. I know? guess, but it's it's my my event. So, yeah, it's your I event. Mean, yeah. That 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 helps a bit. I mean, there are obviously more forces at work above me. In, in but dictating. it always feels like it's in this separate pocket of of Marvel where it's like a little bit yeah. more mature. You're allowed to have he's the only superhero who's allowed to lose constantly. You know, yeah. like he but every he girlfriend also, he, he ever has ends line. up in an insane asylum <laughs> or dead. Did you say he also yeah. bangs a lot? He does no. bang a lot. Like, yeah, you know, he like, does bang a lot. I think I think the uh, I prefer the, make the love, show. but all right. I had an I had two yeah. different Daredevil artists who refused to draw him in bed with uh, with women he wasn't married to, which was interesting. Wow. Yeah, I had to prove that he was still married to Mila to get uh, to get one of the artists to draw him in a in the scene together having having sex with his own wife. I've, I've heard stories like that before. Fractions told me stories about like artists refusing to draw things that went against their uh, their moral sensibilities. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's wild. The uh, like, well, you know, Matt Murdock's a tortured Catholic, so yeah, it's it's against yeah. his religion too. <laughs> I was I was I was saying earlier to Charles like the uh, the thing with Daredevil is because Frank Miller kind of set the tone of do whatever you want. And you go, you can go dark, gritty. You can tell longer stories. Like he kind of broke a lot of the constructs back then. Yeah, yeah. That Marvel, that Marvel just kind of like put their hands up, like, all right, it seems to have worked. So, uh, Anna Santa, you take over, do whatever you want. And she was like, sure. He's going to hell, and he's Silver Surfer's there, and Karnak. Like, sure, great. Yeah. And, then, and so everyone, <laughs> because there's nobody ever argues with success. Everyone takes credit yeah. for it. No one argues with it. And so as long as Daredevil kind of sells enough that they're just like okay yeah we don't need to fix it um i think yeah, readers will always be allowed to do what they want on it yeah even kind of if you look back through like the stuff that followed her there's some forgettable runs on it but if you read hmm. them actually or you look at them you're like this is still more interesting than everything else that was coming out at the time yeah well that's the thing like the 90s were a period where frankly a lot of marvel comics were pretty bad and like yeah, quality quality exactly. didn't necessarily win out yeah um, so i think a lot of that stuff just gets overlooked you know but they were having like lee weeks how, how do you put yeah, on hoodies you know. man that's the weirdest thing i've ever seen I, i've got a yeah. uh, i'm in a lot of pain <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's right. why there you go there you go that's that's the that's the quick short answer yeah um, yeah um uh, i should I we should take some more questions right? too yeah, take oh, yeah, yeah. questions I, from other people. You can I'll you can you can stick around, Dad. I'm just gonna bring people in. That's I mean, all. We've got okay. we have twenty percent of the living Daredevil writers, not even living, like the people who've written it, they're here, which That's is true. kind of kind of cool. Unfair. All right, Louis Louis Rosen, I am uh uh spotlighting you. Oh, I can't spotlight. Hi, uh people. All right. I, can Go you hear it. me? Yeah, it's it, it's an honor. I am a huge fan of all three of you. And Daredevil has actually changed my life. Uh, Charles, I met you a couple of years ago. I'm the guy who wrote that law review article. Oh, about, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. My, Daredevil from, yep. from Frank Miller up to your Supreme story. And it changed my mm-hmm. career. I got tenure at the law school where I work. And I'm I about to be this. promoted yeah, yeah. from yeah. Uh, the library to be a, an assistant dean. And this That's helped amazing. in a major way. So I'm grateful to all of you. You've been 
amazing influences on my life and even my career. So I just so that, wanted to thank you all. That's interesting. And, Mr. Mr. Rosen, how have I changed your life? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a giant fan and just oh, from okay. sex criminals to Daredevil, yeah, yeah. Sorry, man. spectacular Spider-Man. <laughs> But, but I, I might write a sequel, in which case I'll be citing your work in Devil's Reign, too, because I think there's a lot of legal issues oh, you, you brought up I'd love to write about. Uh, yeah, my legal issues are a little bit uh, shakier than uh, Charles. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. And if you guys ever come to Orlando Megacon, I'd love to, to meet uh, Chip and Edge and you'd all get a hero's welcome. We should we should do a big Daredevil like row, just all the Daredevil uh and we should we should put them in order of uh, most popular. I think that's important. Do you think so? Do you think that's the way to do it, Chip? Yeah, one hundred percent. Frank Frank Miller and then Bendis and Descent. And then we're all just we're yeah, we're in the back, we're, in the men's room. we're like in the back row. I'll, 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 I'll justify <laughs> being at the far end because I'm like, well, it's probably alphabetical. Zadarsky. It makes mm-hmm. sense. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mr. Ro- Mr. Rosen. Mr. Rosen, thank you. I'm going to uh, bring in somebody else here. Thank you. All right. Take it easy. Uh, do, do, do. All right. Peter, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Howdy. How are you folks doing? Doing um, good yourself. Can't complain. I got this email while I was in the gym and immediately ran upstairs so I could get on the Zoom call. Yeah, exactly. That's why I look yeah. like the, the tool who's not wearing a real shirt. Um, but I just... Uh, I actually have two questions for Chip. Firstly, uh, I'm here from Toronto, so lovely to see another Toronto-based. Oh, yeah, nice. I wanted to ask what it was like, uh, you know, trying to break into comics as a a Canadian and what that journey was like for you. And (laughs) It makes it sound like it's like a hardship being a Canadian in comics. I mean, you know, a surprising amount of like Great White North stuff that you hear from south of the border. Uh, And my other question is more recent. Uh, I'm greedy, so I'm asking too. Uh, I was going to ask what it was like to write for Crossover, which is one of like the craziest comics I'm reading right now and is like just fascinating to me. Uh, What was that like doing? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, the first question a very easy being a Canadian in comics. <laughs> There's way too many of us, probably. Um, uh, crossover was a lot of fun because like Donnie approached me because he needed uh, he needed a fill in um, because of scheduling issues, and he'd already set up the fact that I was missing in his comic uh, without uh, running it by me. I don't know. Didn't seem that uh, uh, fair. Uh, so he suggested that I explore what happened to Chip Zdarsky in his weird crossover universe. And uh, as soon as he said that, I was just like, oh, my God, like, does Chip exist or does Steve Murray exist? Because that's my real name. And so it became a really kind of fun game of um, kind of exploring the fact that I'm, uh, you know, two people, uh, Wait, what? What? but not really. What? I'll, I'll talk to you what? off the air. Um, what? And, and, and Phil Hester uh, uh, was so good. Originally, the plan was I was going to draw myself in it. Like Phil was going to do everything and I was going to draw the Chip Zdarsky version because it was based on how I drew myself in Sex Criminals. But then Phil drew it and I was like, oh, he's so good at capturing my sadness. Like I look so tired and sad in every panel. I'm like, uh, there's no messing with that. Phil Hester's. Have you worked with Phil at all, Charles? Yeah, I, he he was one of the first significant people in comics who was incredible. This is no surprise if you know Phil. who was yeah. incredibly nice to me. Um, he... He, he, I was at a, 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 he's from, I think the, the Midwest, Kansas City or Minnesota, something like that. And I was doing a show in Minneapolis and he, um, he, I, I brought him my book, my very, very first comic Strongman, and uh, to his table. And I was like, I would be so, you know, I think this might be good. I, regardless, I love your work. Would you, you know, I just want to give this to you as a gift. And he's like, no, yeah. no, we're going to do it afraid, you know? And oh, that's amazing. I was like, Holy shit! You value that you you never seen me before. We're gonna you're gonna trade my book for yours, you know. It was it was and you know just stuff like that. So I would I would jump off a bridge for Phil Hester. Many there are so many books. there are so many wonderful people in comics. Yeah. Um, there are also some people socially that cannot uh, uh, interact with human beings. We won't talk about them, but like, yeah, Phil Hester is amazing, and uh, Walt Simonson is amazing. Like every story of Walt Simonson is just like, oh, he's like the best. He sent me. I've got like a Jughead piece right there on the wall mm-hmm. that he just sent me because I was like, oh, you did a cover of my Jughead run. Was like, how much? How much can I give you to get it? He's like, give me your address, kid. And he just like sent it to me with the pencils. I'm just like, it's amazing. 
He's so uh, people and yeah, yeah. The there there are there are a few guys who are just like really top notch people. Phil is one of them. Like that. Um, oh really? Yeah. Yeah, he was. He was. I saw him a lot because I like right when Death of Wolverine was coming out. He was, uh, and I was doing oh, something yeah, at the same time for DC. So they always put us together because he was obviously. You yeah. Know, he, he made them, uh, or you know. So so I I got to know him a bit in his last few years, and he was just always the sweetest guy, and and never, yeah. never had even the slightest hint of like big time at you. You know, it's just like yeah. oh, you, th there's there's a feeling of um. Of, there are people who treat it like this is a family and you're part of the family no matter where you are in it. Mm -hmm. And then there's people who are like, well, I'm, you know, the kingpin and you're just a minion or whatever. And yeah. I, that's Daredevil stuff, by the way, Chip. Um, well, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just got to write this down. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's the ones who are, who are kind and, and help people who are coming up the ladder, I think, who are not everybody has to do that. It's always a choice and it's always kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah. I think, I think that's the big thing is, um, treating people equally across mm -hmm. uh across that ladder i guess um because yeah. I, I noticed um especially when sex criminals hit I, I was being treated differently at shows by people mm -hmm. uh who would normally treat me one way and now are treating me another way i'm just like oh nothing's changed about me but your perception of right. me has changed enough that now you're treating me better or in some cases worse i'm just like it was a very hard thing to navigate uh uh how people treat you know, we'll talk about, let, let's have another conversation about that offline, because that's yeah, something yeah. that I think about all the time. And it's a very interesting subject to me, even just as our, as my career continues to grow and change, how, you know, my perception of myself is, is relatively static, you know, yeah. uh, I, I think, but then the way that you start to just sort of be a different person to other people yeah. is, is a really, really difficult, weird thing to navigate. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. And like, everyone wants... I mean, I always think about this, the fact that like their interaction with you, they're going to remember that even if you don't remember it, like the, it'd be like a minute with you and they're going to go over every word that you say, even though I've, I've forgotten it because I'm having uh, thousands of those in a day at a convention. Um, you've got to remember every single interaction I have, Chip. I think that's you. Yeah, well, you write, you write them down in your book. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, yes. a good one, a bad one. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah, I could go on about that too. But um, uh, Peter, I'm going to let you go there and uh, going to call up Lee next. So just one second to do. All right, Lee, I am. Hi, going. can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. yes. Yeah, sorry, my camera's off. I'm in a cafe right now. So is it okay, okay to audio? Yeah, yeah, go for it. All right. Uh, I just wanted to say I really enjoy both of yours' work, uh, Charles. Your social, uh, your Star Wars stuff, especially the Kylo Ren um, mini that you did. So much so, your Hulk run and Chip, um, the Urban Legend stuff that you did. Oh, Marvel Two and One was like one of my favorite comics that have come out, like bar none. Uh, awesome. Thank this you. This is allowed. I have one question for each of you. Um, well, I'll try to make it brief. I'll try to make it brief. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, go for Chip, it. Um, I know that you're going to do like a young Bruce Wayne story for DC soon. Yeah. And I think you'd mentioned you wanted to use like new and old characters in the story. Mm -hmm. I saw that you said you wanted to develop his friendship with, I think there's like a new character called Ghostmaker. Yes. Are you planning on using any older Bruce Wayne friends like Harvey Dent or Tommy Elliott? Uh, Harvey, and, Harvey Dent's one of my favorites. So that's what I was wondering. Um, uh, Harvey and Tommy don't make an appearance in it, unfortunately. Um, uh, mostly because I've, I, I kicked Bruce out of America pretty quickly. Uh, um, uh, Zatanna shows up mm. uh, because they they have they have a, a youthful history together. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm trying to think of yeah, she, Ghost Make Swallows. She poos swallows something like that. Yeah, that's very good, Charles. <laughs> Backwards. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of anyone else I can say that isn't a spoiler. Um, yeah, Ghostmaker was a big one, mostly because uh, James um, recently introduced Ghostmaker as kind of like a contemporary that kind of runs through that origin. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I, I didn't want to dilute that too much by focusing uh, all over the place. I mean, I, Harvey Dent is awesome and, uh, and I'm always talking to DC about uh, more ideas and uh, Harvey Dent's uh, um, would be a part of those ideas, hopefully. Hmm? Yes, we'll please. Um, yeah. I really liked your take on Doom and Two and One. So I was like, oh, you know, when you're doing DC. I was like, oh, when is Chip going to do a good DC villain? Writing writing Doom is a highlight. 
like uh, Charles, maybe maybe you'll agree with me. There's there's maybe five characters that I think every writer agrees on that they enjoy writing. Doom is one of them. Emma Frost, J. Jonah Jameson, Namor, and Ben Grimm. They all have very distinct voices, and they're they're just fun to put words in their mouth. Do you have anything? Anyone outside of that? I mean, I I mean, this might be me, but I I feel that way about Jen Walters. Like I can oh, yeah. I can yeah. write She Hulk all day long. Yeah. Um, it's always it's always really fun to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, you yeah, it's basically those. I you know the, all the rest. The, like like Matt Murdock, right? Is sort of freighted with. It's like what we've been talking about, right? Like you you kind of have to get it right to a degree when you're writing a Daredevil thing, and and some of the others like it's it's like Ben Grimm is kind of effortless, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So in, in a really fun way. Yeah. Um, uh, Lee, another question for. Yeah, for Charles, Charles? actually. Um, yeah, and okay. it's actually kind of tangentially related. Um, I was just going to say, Charles, you're a really rare breed of Marvel writer. And I'm going to explain hey. why I'm saying Handsome. that. Handsome. Handsome. Yes. Yeah, sure. But also, you're a Marvel writer who actually gives a shit about Dr. Doom's minor character son, Kristoff. I remember you mm. used him in that She Hulk run. And yeah, I think yeah. even in like Death of Wolverine, I saw him in like a panel once, I think. I was yeah, just wondering yeah. if you had any plans left for him in your noggin all those years ago. I, I just loved your take on him. He was like this bratty little prince and it was just super fun. Yeah, Kristoff was yeah, great I mean, in your She-Hulk run. Yeah, he's, he's I, I, I needed like a Euro trash <laughs> for that, for that arc. And, um, yeah. and, and the nice thing about Kristoff is that he wasn't really like, you know, he, he, he could be, he wasn't so established that he couldn't be fit into that mold. Like you could believe him as like a partying Euro dress dick in a white suit. And so, um, you know, he, he worked really well there. He was really fun to do. Every character in that run was fun. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that I have a backlog of 50 Kristoff, uh, <laughs> but you know, if it ever came around again, I, I mean, I, I, I have, I came really close to, to doing more She-Hulk like mm -hmm. three times. Yeah. And, and one of them was, was just like continuing past issue 12 or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then there were two different, like very serious, almost went there She-Hulk pitches. And ultimately the way that it worked out and they would have, they would have continued kind of the tone of what I was doing just in huh. very, very different versions. One, which I might still do, but it was basically, um, she hope she dies, uh, she dies in a fight and then she wakes up in the afterlife. And so her job is, it's kind of like that great uh, Albert Brooks defending your life. It's, it was gonna mm -hmm. be like that. She's in heaven basically. And she's dealing with like her clients are all the deceased heroes, um, which I think, <laughs> and if she does a good enough job, she can come back to life, which I think would have been really, 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 really fun to do. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, I would have loved it. And it, it got really close, but then ultimately sort of what happened with it was the same reason I didn't, the same reason She Hulk didn't continue for me is the reason that I didn't do more. It's that the it's it, the bummer about She Hulk is that hopefully this will change with the show. And I'm I'm this is a difficult thing to say, so I'm kind of talking around it. But yeah. She Hulk doesn't really sell the way that it for the the amount that that character is beloved. The runs yeah. even mine, even Dan's, like they don't sell the way you think they do for the amount of love they get. Yeah. So so Marvel has to justify putting talent on them that maybe the numbers don't always back up and it's it's yeah. it's it's a bummer but then you know so so we could never really make it work especially as my star sort of star kind of started to rise at marvel yeah and um and then it, it really became daredevil like like my the you're gonna write another lawyer book became daredevil and you know that's why chip's talking to me today that's the only reason it's the yeah. only reason <laughs> yeah it's a, real, it's a real shame i've heard like um i think Similarly, Namor has had that problem where it's like, you know, he's a really great character, but there's like a bit of pushback in terms of him having like larger ongoings because of that. But maybe well, things will turn yeah. around with you. I mean, I, uh, Invaders was a Namor pitch. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, yeah, I pitched him a Namor book and they were like, great, Namor doesn't sell. Let's make it Invaders. I'm like, I'm pretty sure Invaders doesn't sell either. <laughs> I, I try to make them call it like Secret Avengers or, or anything except for Invaders, but uh, no dice. But yeah, yeah Namor, Namor really is like a hard that, one. Like, yeah, going from niche to like triple niche, but. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, also, I also don't blame them for those choices, right? No. Like they have to keep the lights on. They got to do what they got to do. And it, it makes perfect sense. And I, I'm i just really thrilled. I got to write the She-Hulk when I wrote. Um, it would be have been fun to do more, but I, you know, 
I'm, I'm fine with everything that's happened in my writing career. It's been great. Yeah, I think also, I mean, you and I have the experience of working for Image, so we know mm -hmm. the money stuff probably better than people oh, who yeah. don't work for Image. So we know when a title is like not selling enough to justify it being yeah. in existence, um, mm -hmm. and and that 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 line is pretty close in a lot of titles, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Lee. I'm going to move on to to Adam here, so thank everyone you. gets a, a shot. All right, take oh, it easy. Adam. Have a good night. This is the guy who, who had that comment. We'll see oh. what he does now. See if he redeems right. himself. So right. my 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 first my first thing is that I want to apologize to Charles. Uh, I'd like to formally apologize to Charles <laughs> for my comment. Um, um, I hope you're in a in Charles, a suit and tie right now because that's the only kind of formal apology I accept. <laughs> I, I'm actually wearing I'm wearing two tuxedos, one on top of the other, to make sure it was like extra formal. All right, all so right. So I went all okay, out. That's good. That's good. I like that. I like that moxie. Um, so I have a question for both of you. Um, I'm a really big Star Wars fan, Charles. We've actually talked a couple of times on Twitter. Um, I was mm -hmm. curious, one, Charles, if you would ever do an ongoing Lando series, because I think your Lando mini series is probably the best Star Wars comic I've ever read. Um, and you recently had a Lando focused issue of Star Wars. I want to say it was either 17 or 16 that just, I read that and I was like, they need to just give Charles an ongoing Lando series. Just 17. let him, let him do Lando. Cause the way that you write him is just fantastic. Let um, Charles do Lando. I'm going to get those shirts printed <laughs> up for conventions when I, when I go back. Let Charles yeah, do let Lando. <laughs> Um, um yeah it's i really hope so and then chip for you um so you can both kind of talk about it or whatever is would you ever be interested in doing like a star wars series reading your daredevil i think um the bounty hunter uh valence would be like someone that i think you could write super well and i'd love to see you take on a character like that over in the star wars universe i'll let charles answer first while i consider valence um I, I, I love writing Lando. I'm getting to write Lando in the, um, obviously in the Star Wars flagship title right now. And the, I, I'm, I'm running through one of, presumably one of his biggest character arcs, which is moving from the, you know, shitbag scoundrel that we see in Empire who betrays everybody to a general in the, in the Rebel Alliance uh, who everybody trusts and loves. Uh, and so, I'm getting to tell that story, which is an unbelievable thing. Like, and I'm, I'm modulating, it's happening kind of slowly and pacing it as well as I can. You're seeing the moments where he's like, his eyes are opening. Um, and so, you know, that story to me is, is, is the, the prime real estate for Lando. Yeah. And it's not to say that other stuff couldn't be made up or I couldn't do fun things with him, but, you know, getting, getting to do that original story and then and then doing this one now is is a lot of what I kind of would like to do with Lando, which is not to say that I wouldn't. I mean, Lando's awesome to write. He's also he's he's the Star Wars equivalent of your you know your Ben Grimm's and Dooms. Like he always is a blast. Yeah. So I would I, you know I'm, I'll write Lando as much as I can uh, in anything. But um, Star Wars is a big galaxy too. There's a lot of stories to tell. Is what I guess I would say. Um, as for myself, uh, I, I mentioned earlier I pitched one Star Wars story once um which was the death of jar jar and uh the notes i got back from lucasfilm where they loved it they just had a few notes for me one you can't kill jar jar two you can't use any of these characters three and <laughs> the whole list was basically uh don't do this story um i i i charles is i think charles is a lot better at um navigating um conditions uh, I, I'd say like like the, those kind of notes uh, about um, characters that we don't own, maybe more so than than I am. Um, I, I think I'm professional, but um, but I'm professional to the point where I, I know myself well enough that I probably wouldn't take the assignment um, uh, and instead just try and use my energies elsewhere because I love Star Wars, but I don't. You know, you you mentioned Valance, and I'm like. I, I kind of know <laughs> the character, but um, you know, uh, even reading um, Charles' uh, um, War of the Bounty Hunters and Crimson Rain, I'm just like, which of these characters are created by Charles and which are not? And which should I know? 
because I'm I'm just besides the movies, I haven't I haven't consumed anything Star Wars, so I might not be the best person um, for the job, unfortunately. You know, just to speak yeah, to think- that for a minute, if if you don't have that PhD in Star Wars, it it is a really difficult gig, because yeah. you just you know I know I know artists who who will take a Star Wars job and then it's like they they have to keep you know they get 40 pages of notes on like you know imperial rank badges and things like that and yeah. and that is part of why the the books are good is because that that level of attention to detail but it's also if you don't you know it's like trying to work in if you don't speak french trying to work in french you've got like you know high school friends you kind of like stumbling along like it's not it's going to be really challenging and make you feel bad like you're not yeah. doing a good job um so i think having you have to have like a, a phd in star wars to do it it's I, I find it hard even doing the Marvel and DC stuff like Marvel like I grew up reading I follow a lot of it but there's so much mm-hmm. that gets put out that you can't keep yeah. up with all of it I'm just like there's definitely a, a fair amount of catch-up that has to happen with each project uh, DC yeah, even more so because um, at least with Marvel as a writer you can look at the Marvel fandom wiki or whatever but with DC mm-hmm. it's like well which which earth which version which timeline like yeah. Uh, I find it I find yeah. it very very difficult as a whole other layer that um, yeah I wouldn't be able to handle with Star Wars. Uh, yeah, all right. I, I remember when Bad Batch came out. That was a big thing. Charles mentioned the uh, Imperial Signia, and and people were freaking out because Tarkin was animated like slightly off of what he was supposed to be in <laughs> canon. So I get that, but um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right, and James. Maybe. Hey, hey. How's it going, James? Yeah, good. Um, I was just going to ask, um, between both of your Daredevil runs, there was this really great mini series um by right. Jed McKay when yeah. I think he mm-hmm. just started doing stuff for Marvel. I don't know how long he did yeah. comics before that. But I was wondering if um either of you were involved. Because I thought it did like a really, really great job of kind of you know, like both of you have good touchstones in terms of where he is mentally, but like obviously, like Charles, you hit him with a truck, so it's like a great <laughs> um, kind of <laughs> mid one would... between those two. And if you guys got to have some input on that, Jed is uh, amazing, and that was uh, his trial by fire at Marvel. Like a lot of times, your first gig at Marvel is kind of thrown into a thing with uh, so many guardrails, and you have to make a story out of it. Um, because we knew Charles's run was ending, uh, mine was going to be starting. There's going to be like a gap of a month between the runs, and um, because of where mine was starting, where Charles was ending, um, Marvel still needed to put out books in that month. Um, not to get too inside baseball, but also for trademark reasons. They needed Man Without Fear, uh, a series out. And I remember talking to him, just like, well, can't you just like reissue like <laughs> the original Man Without Fear? And like, no, we got to put something new out. Um, do you want to write it? I'm like, well, no, because I'm like, <laughs> I'm starting Daredevil. Um, and uh, and the only story to tell between these two is Matt in a hospital. Like, who's going to take this gig of Matt in a hospital? And Jed McKay took that bullet. But- and he did such a great job. Like, I remember as the scripts were coming in, I just felt bad for him because I'm like, oh, we put him in this horrible position. Like, I think it was his first Marvel gig. And it was a weekly series, too. Like, he had to produce those super quick. Um, or the art had to be produced super quick. Like, such uh, massive constraints. And the fact that he was able to, to tell, like, a really great story, giving people great insights into uh, Matt Murdock, all from his hospital bed. Uh, is a real testament to Jed's abilities. And uh, he, he's since gone on to, you know, do some great work for Marvel. And I think he's kind of like, he's like the next kind of big creator there at Marvel. Um, you know, his Moon Knight's been fantastic. And uh, I think he's kind of primed to eventually take over like a, like a massive title and blow everyone away. Canadian too. Yeah, it always helps. The, yeah. yeah, I did find it really impressive with the whole, like you had to have a different um, artist for every issue. Because obviously like Daredevil, yeah. like, every run is defined, like definitely by writers, but like there's huge artistic kind of identities for each of them. So yeah, that was what is, like what impressed me about that. Yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's amazing. And yeah, you're going to see big things from him, I think. Um, all right, thanks. I'm going to try and get through a couple more of these just because I got to take off in like five minutes because I've got another podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, Sebastian. 
give me what you got, Sebastian. All right, great. Um, big fan of both of you. Um, I have, can you hear me? No? Yep. Go for it, Sebastian. Okay, great. Um, all right, my question is for Charles. Um, I've been enjoying um, Undiscovered Country by you and um, Snyder. So I was wondering, how do you how both how do both of you coordinate the writing of um of that series? Does one of you script and another one's plots, or uh, how how does that work? We we initially <laughs> we we started uh, with a method that uh, failed miserably, uh, which was basically <laughs> we both we both wrote the issue kind of at the same time. And so it'd be like, hey, what do you want to do for this? Um, okay, well, let's do this. Let's do that. And then, um, you know, I would write some pages and Scott would write some pages and we would like stitch it together and then we'd have another idea. And then I'd be like, okay, let's do this. And so we were rewriting Undiscovered Country 1 like like a million times. And it just God. became, it became because we, we all had thoughts and notes and like we were excited. We we're building this world. And it just became completely untenable. The the book, the scripts were getting like, th and this is like by issue two, right? So like, it wasn't like this was far into it. Like, but by, by the time we, we, we were both co-writing the whole thing with issues one and two, we're like, this absolutely does not work. We cannot do this anymore. So what we will do is we will alternate issues. We will discuss the issues ahead of time. We will give each other notes on like the plot that we're going to be doing. Um, and then we'll, we'll read each other's scripts, you know, for our respective issues. And we'll know what the arc's going to be, so we know where everything's headed. Um, but then one or the other of us has final cut on each script, and that's it. Yeah. So, like, yeah. you know, if if Scott's got a note on, like, I do the even issues, Scott does the odd issues, which means he starts arcs and I finish arcs, which has actually worked out really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's it's been good. And so, you know, if he has a note on issue. 14 or whatever, um, then I listen to it and we talk about it. And sometimes those discussions can be intense, not in a bad way, but like we're both, we're both creators who have, I mean, we're both writers. I don't know how else to say it. Like we, yeah. we're, we're not always going to agree on everything. And so there have been times when we, we will kind of get into it a little bit, but not, not in a like, you know, fuck you man kind of way, more just like, I really think you should really think this through. And, and then we, we just, settle on something and ultimately you know we we make a strong case for whatever we think is right and we'll talk it through and then we'll but whoever has final cut has final cut and so it it it's it's worked out um the the only thing that's a little challenging is that it's tough to write ahead because you really need the other writer's script uh to to move forward so so we're kind of writing a little on the i don't we're not really writing on the fly like we're just writing it as a monthly book but it yeah on other creator-owned books, like I write script, I write scripts way ahead, and and it's been difficult to do that on Discovery, Undiscovered Country. But I people seem to really love that book. Uh, the the sales remain really strong. We yeah. are super proud of it. Um, and and it's a lot. It's it's definitely more work than an ordinary creator-owned book might be. But I think because we both dig it, and working with Camo is a joy, and and the commercial response is great, and there's the movie aspect of it. So yeah. we're like we're definitely going to keep going with it, even though it's 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 a little challenging sometimes, but it's it's awesome. Yeah, I, I find that uh, co-writing um, takes as much time as writing when it comes down oh. to it. Yeah, yeah. with with it, more frustrations. It, yeah, <laughs> because if both people aren't, even if both people are bringing their A games, the A games might be A games in completely different places, and so. Yeah it's really difficult. It can be, it can, it can be tough, you know, um, but the way that Scott and I have resolved it is really just, you know, we're now, we're now like years in at this point. Right. And, yeah. and the way that we resolved it was just to say, look, we have immense respect for each other's ideas, which is the truth. Mm -hmm. And so if Scott is saying something to me, it's not because he thinks I'm an idiot. It's because he has an idea. He has a, a vibe and it's the same yeah. way the other way. And so we just take every difference in opinion about the way a story should go or the way a scene should go from that place. Like Scott is saying this, he's really, really good at what he does, so I should listen. Yeah. Charles is saying this, he's really good at what he does, so I should listen. And then it just, it gets worked out. But like the, the trust and respect is really, which sounds kind of, you know, cheese ball, but that really is a huge part of making it work. Yeah, 100%. Uh, thanks, James. We've got time for one more. So Sebastian's next in line here. Sebastian. Maybe Steven's iPhone's gonna oh no. Sorry, oh, Steven's there we iPhone. go. All right, Sebastian. Oh, 
No, he he muted again. All right, Steven's iPhone, you're next. All right, hey guys. So um, thank you first of all. Um, I wanted to ask you guys both what your thoughts were about kind of like um, in the story, helping people. It seemed like there was a time in comics where issue to issue, uh, saving somebody was almost the main focus of the issue. It gets to a point in comics where the big stories, the big arcs are about the heroes' interactions with their villains, right? So I wanted to ask you both if you thought that, do you think maybe at a time as an audience, we cared more about helping other people? And then maybe now we've come to a point where we as an audience are more concerned with our own interpersonal you know, struggles and, and, and demons and things like that. Because I love Scott Snyder's run, but I remember reading, um, <clears throat> um, what was it, the uh, Death of the Family. And I remember thinking like, oh man, he doesn't really save anybody else. It's all about, it's all internal. And it works for that story. That was the purpose of that story. So it works. But what I loved about both of your runs was that, uh, Chip, yours was about how Daredevil's, um, basically his actions affected his community, how that happened. Mm -hmm. And with Charles, you actually went so far as to pull someone from the community into the world and how that person helped save that community, which to me is, I like when my heroes save people. So I feel like I don't see a lot of that. And I wanted your thoughts on maybe why. It's funny. I've, I've never worked with Steve Wacker. Yeah, Charles, have you? Um, a tiny bit, but he's, he's kind of a legendary dude. Yeah, yeah. He was an editor at Marvel. And um, uh, even though I haven't worked with him, I, I, I've always heard about his main note on things. Uh, it's like Wacker's rule, which is how does this story affect people? Like, mm -hmm. like sure, you got these characters fighting each other and stuff, but like, what's the impact on civilians and the people that they're purportedly there to help and save? Um, so even though I haven't worked with them, that, that's always kind of in the back of my head. Not as like 100% like, oh, every issue's got to show this. But, um, but ultimately, these characters uh, should be about inspiring and, and helping people, um, even if they are dealing with their own demons. But we can, like, I, I, I do get it because we do sometimes kind of get wrapped up in the interpersonal stuff between gods, right? <laughs> and like- Yeah, like uh, in, uh, in, in Miller's Dark Knight, right? When the Dark Knight returns, it's all the beginning is all about him helping people. Mm -hmm. It ends with the way it ends, but in the end, yeah. you, you still kind of get that sense that he's inspired the city. Yeah. 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 And, and that's an interesting case too, because like he's individually helping people at the beginning. And at the end, he's trying to help people on a larger scale. And that's where it becomes, feels sometimes less personal. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I'm, I'm, you know, with my daredevil stuff, like we're kind of, we're inching towards that a little bit like the kind of the rest of my run going forward is going to be less about him like stopping a mugging as it's going to be about trying to change the way people view uh uh crime and rehabilitation and uh um kind of like these bigger issues um and the, these billionaires that are pulling the strings like kind of taking them on so that's going to be a tricky thing because you don't want to you want to be able to show the effects of the bad guys uh, uh, and 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 directly why the, the hero has to stop them. So, the bigger you get, the harder it is to do that. I think. I think I think that's all right. Um, I think in in my Daredevil run, one of the things that really helped me was that I focused so much on him being an attorney. Um, mm. And so every day in his day job, he was interacting with people that he, you know, like he had cases. He had he had individual people that he was he was helping or trying to get off the streets as an ADA or whatever he was doing. And, and the, the character you mentioned, Samuel Chung, who became blind spot. Wow. Um, he was a, a Chinese, a, a DACA kid, right? A, a, China, a kid who was born in China, but was brought over to the United States when he was very young. So he grew up in, uh, in America, considered himself American, but he didn't have American citizenship. And that presents a very specific set of difficulties for people who are in that position in this country. And uh, before I was writing for Marvel, um, writing, you know, before I was a professional full-time writer, I was an immigration attorney primarily. And so yeah. that was a set of, of of circumstances that I knew really, really well. Like what, what Sam Chung's life was like, I had clients who lived that life. And so I knew it. And I really thought it was important to reflect that in you know the, the whole Marvel's the world outside your window. And if I'm writing a, a lawyer character, you know, anyway, the 
I, I agree with you. I think for me, um, making him, you know, really digging into the lawyer stuff helped me get around the idea that it was just going to be like, well, you know, Thor have to say about this kind of stuff, um, which is fun to write. Like it's fun to write all those conflicts and characters and all that stuff. But uh, I, I, I do think there's a reason these are called people level characters, right? Oh, Chip? oh, he picked up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cheesy ass as line. Just, you know, street level people level. Right. Nah, yeah. Look, I, I, I sat there and stared at it for like, I'm like, wow, Chip, Chip said some words here. That's what I said. <laughs> and I got paid for them. Kind yes, of. Yes. Uh, all right. Should we do yeah. Jason to Paula's? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Jason. All right. Let's just do Jason before we go. All right. Thank, Thank you. Guys. All right. Bye, Thanks a lot, Stephen. All right, Jason. Hello. Hello. How Hello. are you? I'm well. How are you guys? Good. Uh, good. Uh, I'll get this quick. So I had to be in and out of class. So if this question was already asked, you can just get me and be done with it. But with both of you working on books and characters for the big two, like Marvel and DC, but also making your own independent books and characters, uh, how do you feel writing for one company influenced the other? Meaning like, is having to stick to a stricter schedule for a character who already has history, ethos and pathos, etc helped in your process for creating your own new characters and sticking to schedules and stuff like that? Uh, um, I, I think, I mean, Charles and I are uh, very specific uh, cases of, of people who um, really stick to schedules, I think, regardless. Um, I think I think a lot of it is like a Charles background as a lawyer, like you can't you can't miss a court date. <laughs> you know you can't miss a filing <laughs> my background working at newspapers was we had to put stuff out every day um there was an editor i worked with at the newspaper that said that working at a newspaper is like being on an airplane that is powered by coal and you you're constantly shoveling coal into the furnace of the airplane or else it will crash <laughs> and you, it will never land until the paper mm -hmm. until you get fired or whatever and um and then, you know, I brought that over to comics, which, you know, comics felt like, oh, just like tons of time. Are you kidding? Like you got a month versus like four hours, which is usually yeah. my deadline at a paper. Um, and then, and like the Marvel DC stuff. Yeah, I don't know if it's like, I don't know if that helped me at all working at those companies in terms of like sticking to schedules. The, the problem with the creator owned stuff is um, there's no one cracking the whip. Um, so I, I find the problem ends up usually being on the, I hate to say it, on the artist side because it's more labor intensive. <laughs> and what happens at Image too is issue one does really well, like really well. And so I, I call it like the Image issue two problem, which is you're just you're you're, you're you know counting the money, and uh, and taking a lot longer on your pages, and next thing you know everything goes off the rails. Um, because you think, oh, I don't need to work as much anymore because I'm making all this money. But that's issue one money. It's not issue 12 money. Um, yeah. So things, things can slow down and go off the rails uh, easier with, uh, with uh, creator-owned books as a result. I have, have I told you about my elaborate system to handle that, to deal with that? No. Well, I'm not going to explain it now because it's, it's a little, but like at some point we'll put it on the list of things we'll talk about offline. But I have, yeah. I have an elaborate system to handle that, which is good. Um, well, I know, I mean, I know structurally, like, uh, you and your co-creators form your own corporation and then yes. like you have a pool of money. And so it's not like you just like, Hey, look at us. We got a hundred grand and we're like buying Porsches or whatever. Like, I mean, you know, you, you basically, I, I run them all like businesses, like literally yeah. like, you know, as if I were making, I don't know pool umbrellas or something like that. Like I, I run it like <laughs> you have, you have a, you have a budget, you have a time, you have deliverables, you know, and, and you need to plan for the full run. Um, and you, you just sort of spin things out and you don't, you don't blow that issue one money. That issue one money is, is, is a, is a, is investor capital basically. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. It doesn't matter. This is, that's boring. Um, the thing that I would say to Anna to what Chip said about the, the Marvel DC work is that what it has done, because I've written, I mean, over a hundred Star Wars comics alone, and probably you know more than that for Marvel and DC when you add it all up. And so it's hundreds and hundreds of of times doing this very weird specific thing. You bring an issue, you write it, you script it, you edit it, you do a lettering pass, whatever. And you do that so many times that you just get to the point where you can. I can't do it in my sleep, but you 
you can shortcut many, many things in your mental process in terms of writing. And so I can generate, like I, I mentioned earlier, I, I don't know if it was when you're on, it was when Ed was on, but like, if I had to, I could go from, I have no idea what this issue is to turning an issue in the same day. I don't like doing it. And I certainly could never have done it when I started writing back in like 2013, but I can do it now. Yeah. And that that is something that it's just the craft being this weird business one. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. It. Good good question, that. Jason. I just got a note saying my internet connection. Thank you guys. Oh yeah. Uh, right. Thanks, Jason. And uh, Thank that's going to be that's going to be it for today. Thank you for joining mm -hmm. Chip and Charles Chum Chat. Uh, we'll be posting this video on YouTube with Charles's uh, permission um, yeah, for people that yeah, can yeah, take sure. it. Oh. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's it. And I got to go um, record a, a podcast in four minutes. So <laughs> see you later, Chip. This was a blast. Thank yeah, this was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye.